Hello and welcome to Melton Vineyard's online service. Our vision as a church can be summed up in three words. Bless, serve, pray. We want to bless others with the unconditional love of Jesus that we have experienced. We'll serve each other and the wider community and we will pray so that we can do all this in the power of God's Spirit. Our vision for these online services is that they're a space where you can explore faith and discover what kind of church we are at your own pace and in your own way. Each week we share a worship song and a short talk which we hope you'll find encouraging and helpful. If you believe that Melton Vineyard might be a church you could call home and you live in or near the Melton area, we would love to welcome you to one of our on-site services, which are every Sunday morning at 10.30am at John Fernley College. Let's pray. Father God, please meet with us through your Holy Spirit as we turn our hearts and our thoughts towards you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I'm still. 
morning again. Um, today's uh, the first day and a start of a new series that we're doing on looking at the book of Psalms, which is going to be done over the course of the summer uh, by the preaching team, looking at individual Psalms. And Psalms are found in the middle-ish of the Bible and is a collection of about 150 Hebrew, not about, it is a collection of 150, uh, Hebrew songs, poems, and prayers from many different time periods in Israel's history. They're written by loads of different people, including King David, um, Asaph, the sons of Korah, Moses, Solomon, and many worship leaders, and nearly one-third of the Psalms' authors are anonymous. Um, as with the rest of the Bible, we can draw a lot of strength and encouragement from the book of Psalms. And there's something about the Psalms that seems to be covering the full range of the ups and downs of the human experience uh, and how we're looking to God through every season of our soul. And I think sometimes, for me personally, in the name of trying to do the right thing, I can sometimes filter out um, emotions so much trying to think about how I'm supposed to feel or think about a certain situation that I sometimes don't pr process those thoughts well. And one of the things I love about Psalms is they seem quite unfiltered sometimes in the emotion, how uh, the authors seem to just go for it. Uh, take this classic line from King David in Psalm 3 verse 7, strike my enemies on the jaw and break the teeth of the wicked. <laughs> that really just gets you there, doesn't it? And I've not heard the worship team cover that one yet, um, but I look forward to it if they do. So, <laughs> before I get into today's reading, I'll just explain a little bit of backstory um, from my own experience as a run-up to the message today. I think sometimes when I do a talk, I sometimes let you all know how daft I've been in the past as an encouragement to you. So I like to get that bit over and done with early on in the talk, and then we'll move into reading today's uh, psalm, which is Psalm 46, on, this, on the point of trusting God through difficult times. So in my own experience, uh, when I was a youth, I, um, I knew that God was real. I knew that somehow he knew everything, but he didn't seem particularly present to me. I also know, knew that he had standards, and he was very holy and righteous. And my behavior and my experience and environment made it quite difficult for me to match that up with, with what I knew of God. <clears throat> and I felt that sort of not following Jesus at those times resulted personally for me in a lot of confusion uh, and pain. I felt like I should sort my life out, get myself right, and then maybe God would accept me, which is the opposite of grace, just in case anybody's struggling with that right now. Um, Jesus said in, his, in Matthew 16, whoever tries to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will truly find it. So you can imagine how excited I was to finally have the common sense to surrender to God's will at the age of 21, having exhausted all of my own ideas, um, to, to experience God's love for myself. And that, is what I, that was my experience, that I'd found life. I'd found life in Jesus, and I was seeing some wonderful things. I was seeing answers to prayers. I was praying for people, and God was healing them. I was getting dreams and visions from God. It was very exciting, and I was really just aware of how amazing God is and how much he loves people and wants to do good stuff for them. And it literally was a transformation. Um, but one of the problems that I did have was I thought that if things weren't going well, God had forgotten me. You know, it was almost like if I went and saw God do something, I'd be like, yes, the, my faith is here. And it's like things didn't go well. It's like, oh, God's forgotten me. Um, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? God, have you forgotten me? What, where are you? What's going on? Um, so when I was younger, you know, my parents would sometimes make a suggestion that I had selective hearing. I don't know if anybody else has got youths that they like to tar them with that brush. Um, they could say things like, don't get tattoos. And I'd get, get tattoos. Stuff like, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I remember uh, saying something quite daft to my mum. Bearing in mind, my experience with Jesus was, if you're not following Jesus and going the opposite way, there's pain and confusion. So now that I am following Jesus... 
in my early days and I'm experiencing feelings of pain or confusion or I'm going into the unknown, I don't know where, where you're at, God. It was a bit, bit difficult for me because um, um, I started to get into sort of a type of teaching that is if you've got enough faith, you can dodge suffering. I don't know if you've ever come across that kind of teaching. It's very enticing, isn't it? That somehow if you've got enough faith, you're not going to experience any problems. Uh, that's not actually what Jesus taught. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer or take heart. I've overcome the world. Um, but while I was in this lane of teaching, if you like, I said something stupid to my mum which she often likes to remind me of which is I will never get sick again um yes that would be wonderful and you know what it wasn't long before I ran into some difficulty with my theology slash wishful thinking I began to experience these difficulties because basically imagine if you have unbound energy and you think that you're invincible and will never get tired never get sick and it, you know what I mean? I spread myself so thin and was working too hard, doing too much. I had poor boundaries. I felt responsible, personally responsible for everyone and everything. Um, and I got sick. And I got more and more sick. And it was really difficult because then I felt double terrible because I thought maybe I haven't got enough faith. Remember, this is the type of teaching that I was embracing that... You know, if you've got faith, you won't suffer. So then I was thinking, oh no, I'm suffering here. What's, what am I doing wrong? Everything's gone, you know what I mean? It's all on me again. Um, because my faith and my ego was built on works, basically. It was on what I could do for Jesus or with Jesus. It's more for Jesus than with Jesus, I guess. Uh, when, as Neil was talking last week about doing stuff in his own strength and hitting that point where we allow God to be God. And, uh, and we, we'd do it in God's strength rather than our own. Um, but I was, it, was a, it was a big blow, you know. I thought, I, I want to be the man that does the stuff. I want to be the guy who's this, that. You know, that was my identity. It was more in the doing than it was in the who Jesus is. So at that point, I was so sick, I couldn't help myself, let alone anyone else. And it took about five or six years to begin to feel better. But as an outworking of that difficult time, and many other difficult times, I can say I trust God more today, and my faith is even more in Jesus and God's uh, character and ability rather than my own. And I had to let God love me, even though I couldn't do anything for him. <sighs> that was hard. But you can't do anything, so you've just got to <laughs> accept the truth. And uh, yeah, last, last week, Neil was sharing that quote, and I, I don't know if it hit home for some of you, where God spoke to somebody, a vineyard leader, and he said, if God said, if you don't let me love you, you won't finish the race. If you don't let me love you, you won't finish the race. That's where we get our strength from, God's love. So I don't know where each of you are at today with your journey of trusting God, but my question is, are you letting God love you? I hope so. So some of you here might be on top of the mountain, so to speak. Everything might be going really good. Your relationships might be strong. You might be getting a promotion at work. You might be doing all this stuff that's going really well. And honestly, we rejoice with you. We celebrate that. And I know for a number of people here, your circumstances are not amazing. There's challenges that you're facing and things that are difficult. And you... <coughs> And you feel that through some of the trials that you might be facing, that your foundations are really being shaken. You might think, how are you gonna, where are you going to live? How are you going to pay the bills? You might have received bad news. You might be facing grease, grief or loss of a loved one or trapped in addiction. The list could go on. But one thing I'd like us to turn our attention to today, with all the things going on in all of our lives, and those around the lives of those around us is the goodness of God and his unfailing love for each one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do not sleep or slumber. You are always present and you'll never leave us or forsake us. You're with us through the good times and the bad times and everything in between. 
And would you speak to us today through this word that we might be edified in our love for you and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like us to turn to Psalm 46. The word should come up on the screen. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and mountains quake with their surging. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire, he says be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I'd like us to focus on the first five verses and sort of work our way through those. So it says, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. So God is our safe space, is our safe place and he's helping us in our trouble. I, I would think that, you know, God's abandoned me when the trouble came. Not so. He's not going to help you afterwards. He's helping you in the midst of your trouble. He is helping you because he's present in your life. And he, like I prayed a minute ago, he doesn't sleep or slumber. He's, forgot, uh, he's not forgot about you. And it's not that he's not there. Just out of curiosity, has anyone gone through a trial that seemed really confusing? It seemed like... Where's God in all this? And it wasn't until you came out the other side and looked backwards that you could see where God was. Just a show of hands. Very interesting. <laughs> because challenges can be disorientating, can't they? They can take our attention. They can, uh, they can challenge us in a way that just the normal everyday stuff doesn't. And um, I like the, uh, the declaration instantly after the, on the note of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. So this is speaking of the faith and trust in God in those difficult times and times of extreme chaos. In terms of feeling secure in the natural, sometimes... <clears throat> Earth and mountains, we, we class those as a pretty sure thing. When I'm walking around, I don't kind of, you know, I'm thinking about the stuff. But if those foundations start shaking, it draws my attention on things aren't always as steadfast as we like to think, but God is. Um, so we all have these mountains or earth in our life, things that we think are sure things and we don't necessarily think about those sure things unless they start going wrong it could be our finances our family our health our position our spouse our children our reputation our achievements whatever those mountains might be the things that we take as sure things they might quake but like I said before we can have uh, confidence in God's ability to help us in our trouble God's ability to to sustain us and deliver us uh, from trouble. So moving on to verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. During the time that this was written, besieging cities was a real threat. So the opposition would put an army around the perimeter of the city or the fortified area and force the city, its citizens, to surrender. But it was quite difficult to besiege a city that had a river running through it. 
due to the people being able to have access to the water and maybe even fish too. Often it speaks of the spirit being like a river in scripture. And the book of Revelation talks about the heavenly city and how the river of life, clear as crystal, flows from the throne of God. I was listening to a meditation by Tim Keller on this subject and he was reciting part of a sermon written by the revivalist preacher and theologian Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards wrote this wrote a preach when he was only 18 years old on Christian happiness. Cool hair as well, hasn't he? Um, the three main points of his sermon were, your bad things can turn out for good. Your good things can never be taken away from you. And the best is yet to come. So it says in Romans that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Your good things cannot be taken away from you. Meaning you've been justified by faith. You've become a son or daughter of the Most High. You've become a citizen of heaven through your faith in Jesus. And that citizenship can't be taken away from you. I know some people here might have lost their citizenship through their circumstances. But I just want to encourage you today that Jesus has given you a heavenly citizenship that can't be taken away by laws, wars, governments or plagues Jesus said whoever believes in me as the scriptures said rivers of living water will flow from within them so the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of you meaning you are hard to besiege and thirdly the best is yet to come the biggest thing that could happen to any of us is our physical body would pass away. But as a Christian, that would send us directly into God's loving arms. And this is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He understood that revelation, that we have a hope for the future. And Jonathan Edwards would say, that Christians who know and understand these things can truly be happy. I'd like to finish uh, with a poem that many of you will be familiar with, um, it's called Footprints in the Sand. So you might want to close your eyes and just listen to this. So, one night I had a dream as I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flash scenes from my life. For each, each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to me and one belonging to my Lord. After the last scene, my life flashed before me. I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I need you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you, I'll never leave you. Never, ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you.
Thank you for watching. We hope you found this online service helpful and encouraging. If you'd like to find out more about Melton Vineyard or get in touch with us, our website is meltonvineyard.org.uk. And of course, you can find us every Sunday morning at 10.30am at John Fernley College on Sculford Road. If you're able to make it to one of those on-site services, we would love to meet you. In the meantime, God bless.